Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter at The World covering global health. This is a live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic, mental health fatigue, the holidays, and resiliency. With me is Kariston Conan, Professor of Psychiatric Epidemiology at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. There's Happy so to much. Be here. Yeah. <laughs> there's so much to get into. Um, you can post your questions for us on Facebook at forum at HSPH, at forum HSPH, or email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and WGBH. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we all may know, is taking a serious toll on our mental health. Uh, so striking, a CDC survey conducted in June found that 40% of adults in the US are now struggling with mental health or substance misuse. And that includes at least one in 10 respondents who reported having seriously considered suicide over the last month. Even more troubling, these percentages are greater for people of color, for young adults, caregivers, and essential workers. At the same time, many of us are also experiencing pandemic fatigue and this timing couldn't be worse as COVID-19 cases are surging and don't appear to be letting up in the United States. So on top of that, we have the holidays coming up. Many people will be coming closer together in close quarters um, and dealing with that um, mixed emotions about meeting or not. So it's all a lot. And so today we'll be talking about all of these things and with you how to build resilience, how to manage the holidays, and to begin, Karisin, we spoke in the spring actually about a lot of these signs that mental health may be a big um, challenge in the coming months. And I wonder if you can give us a picture of how this is playing out, of how mental health, how the pandemic has impacted mental health so far. Sure, Alana. Um, yeah, so when we met in, the, in April, I think it was, uh, we predicted, or many people are predicting um, a, you know, a mental health crisis in addition to the pandemic. And I think, um, unfortunately, the data has actually borne a lot of that out. Um, so at that time, we didn't know, but that's um, what we saw coming. And you mentioned the CDC study. There's been a number of other studies and uh, colleagues published something in JAMA Network Open, which, show, which showed that not only are there more cases of anxiety and depression, sort of like clinical depression, anxiety disorders, but that the whole, you know, the whole population, the whole community, we've sort of become more depressed. So, so there's more depressive symptoms and there's more people with, who may not really qualify for being depressed or actually like meet a doctor's diagnosis but they're experiencing some symptoms of depression, anxiety, you mentioned also, you know, you know thoughts of suicide. Um, and I think it just speaks to the ubiquity of the pandemic and the issues. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, I don't even know if we have to talk about why. <laughs> there are so many reasons why that is. In addition to um, the, uh, you know, the threats of the virus, worries about getting sick, in addition to that, we've had um, incredible turmoil in this country in terms of awakening around racial justice um, and, and, uh, and issues related to that. Um, there's been, um, there's still you know, millions and millions of people unemployed. Stimulus benefits have run out. So there's just sort of like been a pounding of stressors that are the pandemic itself and then all the things that have stemmed from the pandemic in addition to other things going on. This may seem like a very straightforward question, but mm -hmm. like when you say as depressive symptoms oh, in yes. the community, what do you mean by that? Like oh, sure, no, that's a good question. Um, um, so people feeling, so depressive symptoms are things like feeling down, feeling blue, where it persists over days or weeks. It's not you know, just temporary. Um, feeling, um, un being unable to sleep, having trouble concentrating, um, not really getting pleasure in things you used to get pleasure in. Um, so maybe, you know, in April or May or June, you like going for walks or whatever, or certain things, but you, but the things even that you used to enjoy, you're not enjoying anymore. So some of those, some of those, those are some of the like depressive symptoms. And I think people are just experiencing more of those. Um, and, uh, even if they don't, you know, necessarily like, again, aren't, aren't going to be diagnosed with by a doctor with depression. 
you mentioned that we're seeing this kind of predicted kind of crisis play out. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, for example, in hospitals, mm -hmm. um, you know, there has been this push to scale up their capacity. Um, has there been a similar thing happening amongst mental health specialists and the system as a whole to really scale up the services and the responses? I think, um, so the answer is yes and no. So in the sense of, I would say the mental health community broadly has, has really tried to respond. And in ways, for example, clinics have gone from being in person to online. Insurance carriers moved from not covering virtual visits. It was very hard to get phone or video visits covered. They've moved to coverage, to having to cover that. That's enabled providers to keep seeing patients from home or see new patients. Um, the amount of resources that I've put out there, some my group has done, but sort of every organization, American Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association has put out a massive amount of resources, information, webinars, treatments, um, different apps have like Headspace and things have offered, you know, free uh, memberships. So there's been sort of a, from the ground, like grassroots, there's been this incredible sort of outpouring but unfortunately, we haven't had anything from the top down. So there hasn't been any, any national or even, um, you know, really major statewide, as far as I've seen, um, policies to scale up. So it's really been at the individual provider or clinic level where people have, you know, reached out and tried to do, tried to, um, you know, increase access. I have also heard that, um, Waiting lists have gotten longer at clinics. Uh, one of my colleagues works in, you know, so that is, and they're, they're increasingly getting longer, both reflecting the increased demand for people for services, um, but it's not like we produce more providers during this time. So um, I think um, one of my colleagues, Rick Rometoy Patel, always says, um, in terms of mental health, every country is a developing country. So I think that, you know, we are hitting some of that, um, that sort of wall we have with capacity which is going to take bigger, bigger, it's sort of, I know there's bigger things that need to be addressed there. There's two follow-up questions I have yeah. on that. One is what would be the role of like state or federal policies? Like, do you see that as being, what would that look like? And are you saying that from, as you see this play out, that that's going to be needed? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we'll start with that. Okay, sure. And I will say that I am, you know, I'm an epidemiologist and psychologist, not a policy person um, or an economist. But if I had to choose one intervention to improve the mental health of Americans, I would say Congress needs to pass a stimulus package. The number one thing that can be done is to have people get in, to to get people back to getting unemployment benefits and protect people in their homes. Cause those are two things we know um, when people lose income and they lose their homes that increases mental health problems. So that is, that, that would be number one. And then I think there are a lot of people, a lot of the smart policy people, there are things like um, for example, that gets, gets in the, in the way of capacity is not being able to see patients across state lines. So if I'm licensed in Massachusetts, I can't see a patient in Texas, let's say. And so there's those kinds of challenges which need to be addressed at a higher level that I think um, could increase capacity, especially places where you're not gonna necessarily increase the number of providers in the state or in the area, but you could, um, I think one of the positives that's come out of this is the comfort and the um, use of telehealth and people reporting that it's been effective and useful. And so we could- That, that surprises me. I was curious yes. how effective virtual is in terms right. of right. the- in-person connections or right or well actually and interestingly the um the american the veterans affairs a department of veterans affairs has actually done quite a lot of research on this on veterans on um treating veterans um, in person and virtually because obviously there's a healthcare system that provides evidence-based care but um has to do it you know across a lot of geography and there's a lot of evidence that um tele telemedicine um, for mental health can be as effective as in person. Um, I think there's, you know, there's, there's, there's like finer points on exactly which treatments and what the, you know, the challenges are if you can't, you know, if you don't have good internet, then it's going to be challenging to, to use it. Obviously, you're going to have to be able to see a, a provider on, on video. But yeah, so there actually is evidence and certainly the individual providers have reported that their patients have been able to come. Um, and some who've seen 
kids have said it's actually been a little easier because parents aren't having to like, you know, get them into the office and things. So I think there could be a lot of positives there. Um, you mentioned Vikram Patel and kind yes. of this global connection. And I wonder the, what you're seeing here in the United States, um, you also do research globally. And I'm wondering what you're hearing from colleagues about how this mental health trend is, um, what you're seeing globally. Right. I think that um, one of the things that's been striking to me is how consistent um, the reports are globally from um, now there've been, uh, now we have published data. We didn't have this in April from, from Europe, um, a lot of work in Italy, from China, um, from um, South America. We have, a, there's a lot of work out there and, you know, every report I've seen has reported increased rates of anxiety and depression, which is what people study. And then some, you know, substance use where they've looked at that. Um, where we've done, we did a, a global pregnancy survey and um, of pregnant women. And um, what we found was that um, the countries we had the highest responses were US, Mexico, China, and South Africa. And what was remarkable was the high levels of depression, anxiety, and loneliness as well uh, across all the countries. So I think what's striking is what we're seeing is it seems consistent. I mean, time will tell um, whether that holds up and whether those things persist over time or um, in some countries are, you know, they're mitigated. There's questions coming in. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. But I do want to get to this follow up. Um, you know, winter is also coming mm -hmm. and there is this growing research showing that around the globe um, there are growing um, trends in depression and anxiety and these sort of things. So what are your suggestions for managing that? And in particular in places like the East Coast that are delving into winter months where um, maybe some ideas of exercising outside or mm -hmm. meeting people outside or doing things um, are may be happening less. Right, yes. Um, and I'd love to hear other people's ideas myself. Um, I mean, it's, I would say, first of all, I'm gonna say it's really hard. I mean, my own family, we're figuring this out for Thanksgiving and what to do. And so some of the things I would, I, you know, I'm gonna be personal about the things that have been helpful to me. Um, Cause I can say that it's, it's also a struggle on my end some days. Um, one thing is that we had the news about um, Moderna and Pfizer about the vaccine efficacy. And so, I try to remind myself that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, when we spoke back in April, we really didn't know, but um, that we actually, I do think that we have a lot of reason to believe that this will be much better by the summer. So um, it's gonna be a hard few months. So that helps me that's to see that, to remind myself this is not forever. It feels really crappy, but this is not forever, it's, it's today. And then um, the other things I think that, um, people can find helpful around the holidays is I've been trying to rethink it and try to, and try to, um, for example, been looking into opportunities to deliver meals on Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is my personal family's favorite holiday. It is the huge holiday where we ever together and we can't do that this year. So thinking about ways that I could give back that might um, make me feel better and actually be helpful. Um, and then I think some, um, but at the same time, just recognizing that it's going to be that it's going to be hard, and um, that's that that's okay. And thinking about creative ways you can still do some of the um, things that maybe you used to enjoy. Um, are there like you know uh, games you can play online? Um, making time to talk to your relatives, especially for me, like it's my mom who's in her seventies in Atlanta, and I, ha I, I by then I won't have seen her for a year. Um, and then, um, the other challenge families are facing and my own family is facing is we lost loved ones this year to COVID. And, um, the last time we were all together was Thanksgiving. Mm. Um, and so I'm sure, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people around the country who are facing the same thing. And I think one of the things we're trying to do is to acknowledge that loss and, um, making time to talk about people and actually, it's um, sort of, I'm gonna say it feels better, but it feels more authentic to acknowledge um, the grief than to sort of pretend like, oh, it's all fine. And I think that would have been hard anyway, losing those people and getting together, but it's, you know, it's just gonna be more, more challenging this year. 
Well, first, I'm so sorry for your loss. Of us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this actually transitions into a question about bereavement from mm. online, which is, I mean, how, what can people do who are struggling with grief mm. when the rituals are off limits? Um, and you spoke about some of this, but it's really disrupted end of life rituals too. And I mean, again, in the United yes. States, there's been what, more than 200,000 deaths. Right, right, right. Um, so it is really challenging. I would say the losses of my family, we actually never had a formal funeral memorial um, because, you know, for lots of reasons. But um, so some of the things, I think if you can make the time to, it's not gonna be the same as the rituals, but some of the things we've done is make time to get online with family members and talk about and, and share memories about those that have lost. Now in, the, in normal life, we would do that in person. People would visit or you'd have a memorial, but um, just even having, you know, on a Sunday afternoon or kind of getting it on FaceTime or Zoom and just talking about that, that has helped, that has helped a lot. Um, also um, people, um, you know, so old school to write letters and stuff anymore, but to, to um, write about, um, look at pictures, share pictures with a family member or someone you're, you're with, all that kind of stuff to, to just to spend the time remembering and letting the emotions come and sort of experiencing them can, you know, that, that is something you can do. And then I think the other thing is you could think about planning something, some kind of acknowledge it in the future. Um, and um, you know, that's something we're talking about. And obviously that's, that's sort of not known what, when that future will be, but um, you know, again, we're not gonna be in this forever. And so there will be a time when perhaps you can come together and acknowledge that. Thank you for that yeah. and for sharing about your own kind of experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this question's from Amber. There's two questions, but um, I think in kind of moving towards kind of emotions, dealing with anger and sadness mm. um, right now, um, she has two questions um, or parts of a question. One is like, how do you deal with these emotions, for example, with anger and sadness? Um, and in this case of seeing others live semi-normal lives while you're trying to be mm. careful. Um, and then the other part is like, how do you overcome like the anxiety or the anxious brain when every single thing you pick up could have, like you could spread COVID to somebody who's vulnerable, um, even when masking, feeling like there's just this really infectious disease around us. Mm -hmm. Those are really good questions. So I would say the first thing, and it sounds like Amber's already done this, is you need to acknowledge and recognize the, the emotions you're having. So you are feeling angry and you're feeling angry at the people, whatever outside. I mean, I, I, I see a field and sometimes I see people congregating, <laughs> like, what are they doing? Um, so acknowledging the um, emotions. And um, I think the other piece is is really being aware of how you're taking care of yourself. Because if you're feeling, if you're sleep deprived and super stressed from other things and not eating right and not getting exercise, you're gonna feel anger and anxiety more that the way you're, you take care of your body is related to how you feel emotionally and vice versa. So although things like what you eat and you know taking a walk may not seem like they're helping you manage the emotions, they are absolutely. And then I think um, in terms of anger, you know, the other things you can do is, you know, spend some time with it yourself, like journaling or, you know, whatever, if you do something creative, something creative, and personally I do journaling um, and trying to figure out like, where is it, where maybe, maybe there is a place you can do something about it that you need something you need to address. And where is it you kind of just need to process it? So, um, you know, perhaps there's someone in your life who isn't being safe and you're worried about them and you're also angry at them and you need to think about how to approach them versus um, just sort of, you know, anger at the world or at the situation, which there's not going to be, um, you know, there might not be an action you can take. So I think taking some time to, to kind of figure that out can be helpful. This is a question from online. Um, and how do, what do we know about the long-term effects of the pandemic on kids' mental health? Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's going to be some sort of psychological imprint on a whole generation? And what can families and caregivers do and with promoting that resilience? 
That's a great, yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think, you know, we don't know. Um, from what we're learning, I think the effects on kids' mental health are so highly variable by their context and their age um, and the exact struggles they're having. Um, and so much for younger children, so much depends on how their family and caregivers are doing. Um, and then for older kids, like I have a young adolescent and adolescents, there's different issues because, you know, they, you know, honestly, they're not supposed to be with their parents 24 hours a day. So they're going a little, you know, crazy, crazy about that. Um, so I think it, it very much depends. And also I think there is a question, and I've, I've thought about this myself because I have a 13 year old is how will this affect the way they think about health and, you know, the world and everything. So I think there are a lot of open questions, I guess I have, and I would imagine it will have some imprint on them. It may not all be negative. One of the things I've seen with my son who's 13 is it, like, he wears a mask, no problem. Um, he, um, he sort of has this growing understanding of health as something we share as a community, not as something that's just up to an individual. And I sort of wonder if this generation will have that, and that actually could be a really positive thing. Um, and then in terms of how to help kids, we do have something in the resources that'll be po that are posted. Um, we have a session on, on kids um, on our forum, and there are some specific things about kids. I think one of the things to remember with kids is that um, they, uh, they can like, they're, they have really good truth detectors are like, you know, uh, so they thinking about their age and what you can share with them in terms of how you know, old they are and what they'll understand, but they don't, they don't believe you if you just say, everything's fine and things aren't. So navigating the sharing information and not being overwhelming with being genuine is really important. And then also for parents, um, you know, I'm a working mom with a kid, it's really hard right now. There's a lot of evidence that people with kids at home and women especially are suffering. Um, there is truth, it's so hard, but there is truth in that, um, you know, a lot of how well your kids manage their stress will be, they'll be watching you. Um, and so they're really important for parents to figure out ways, parents and caregivers to figure out ways to take care of themselves um, is really, really important. You mentioned things like for you that's helped is journaling, mm -hmm. um, taking care of your body and, yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this question from online, just to clarify, like, are there, what kind of tools can um, oh, sure. you've learned to be more resilient? Oh, yeah. Okay. I said, it's funny. If my 13 year old was home, he would uh, be laughing at, he's, he's, he's really prompt to show me when I'm not resilient. So um, anyway, <laughs> that's been very humbling. Um, <laughs> but um, so some of the tools, um, I have found, that, so some of the tools I have been, I, I, um, I'm been traditionally quite into yoga. So I, um, I do, I, I try to do a yoga class or two a week online. They're actually, those resources are massive out there, including free resources and ones you pay for. I mean, you can practice with teachers, famous teachers all over the world. I use an app called Insight Timer, which is a meditation app. It has sleep meditations, it has free courses on mindfulness um, and, and you know, all kinds of stuff uh, like that. So I use that. I also um, really, I have a dog, so I make sure I get out and exercise. I have to, the dog, um, every day. So those are some of the, so the, those are some of the things I do. And the other thing I do, which is a little strange to say in this conversation, is that I do try to practice turning off the news like podcasts, my Twitter, I will confess, I took my Twitter app off my phone for a while, that kind of thing, because I have found that taking a, I need to take a break from all that sort of stuff coming in. And then actually a fourth thing I just did was I just attended a free online program on the Monet exhibit at the MFA, uh, which is the Museum of Fine Arts. And that was fabulous. It's like I looked at videos of, of like of Monet, um, online and that's not a normal thing I make time to do but there are a lot of things out there like that free concerts and things and so trying to bring something into your life that's that is like feeds your soul I think is really important it's challenging but really important 
Are the things, this is from online, and I, there are some like more um, kind of trend and questions that yes. I have, but just yeah. because we're on this thread, there's a lot of questions coming in and follow-ups. Okay. Um, one is, are there things uh, that to build resilience that are the same for stress relief or are there different things? Oh yeah, I think actually a lot of the things that you build for stress relief are um, build resilience too. I think of resilience and it, it, it's, sometimes it seems like this sort of, it's hard to get your hands on what it means, but I like to think of resilience as a capacity um, that we can build with practice and like anything. And what I mean by practice is, um, that we can build it in small steps over time. So, um, you know, going for a five minute walk, closing your computer and sitting and breathing for five breaths, all of that manages your stress and builds resilience. Um, so it's even those small things and the analogy that I, I, I've taken this from someone, it's not my analogy, but is that um, if you think about something like a sailboat, if you move the rudder just a little bit, if you change, shift direction just a little bit in the present, you'll be in a different place in the future. So even these small things, which may not seem like, they may not seem like, oh, they're not going to change your life today, can have a big impact over time. And I guess from the clarifying the question, those same things are good tools for stress relief. Yes, they manage your stress and they build resilience. I would say they do both. Yes, absolutely. Um, how do you, just one more on this thread, this is from online. What if you feel like you don't have the energy to be resilient right now? And you mentioned the sailboat metaphor, but how do you give yourself the mental space to feel badly without sinking into like a full on depression? That's, <laughs> yes, that is, that is, hard. Um, so I think it is, um, I think right now that we have to, it, it's, it's a balance um, of acknowledging that things are hard and not, you know, pretending like not deluding yourself that they're not and whatever, everyone's heart is different. Some people lost loved ones. Some people have sick people they're taking care of. They lost their job. So acknowledging those things are hard. Um, and then to consciously choose to do things that are going to improve your mood. Um, when we treat depression, like in the clinic, there's something we call behavioral activation. And basically part of that is just like, if you're feeling bad, often you don't want to do things that are going to make you feel good. So what we have patients do is make a list of things that make them feel good. And they're actually like assign them for homework. Hmm. So some of it is making yourself do things that, you know, you know, you know, might make you feel better from the past. Right now, you don't believe it right now, like nothing's going to feel good, but making yourself do it anyway. And often that will help a bit with your mood. And if nothing else, again, if it's something physical, like going for a walk, if nothing else, it will give you some exercise. But there's, there's just, there's lots of evidence that exercise actually helps with depression. So so that's some of it. It's, it's actually really, it's a challenging time. It's a really challenging time. This question comes from the world's Facebook page. Yeah. Um, now that we're in a kind of fall surge, mm -hmm. like in 1918, are there lessons from mental health perspectives that we can learn from that period? Or even from, I would expand that to other um, outbreaks or pandemics of the past? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's actually a great question to look into in terms of if we know from him. So I guess the, the first thing that occurred to me when you were talking about that was that we know it will end. So the 1918 pandemic was horrible and it ended. Um, Ebola, SARS, uh, they didn't become pandemic. They were more localized epidemics. Horrible for the communities that experienced them they did end. So I guess one thing we can learn is there will be an end. We will not be in this forever. Keep our eye on that. Um, and then um, secondly, what we learned from, I, I know from more of the recent epidemics, um, is we learned quite a lot about, for example, how to protect the mental health of people in quarantine, um, which is, is um, to provide, to make sure you provide really good information about how long they'll be in quarantine, what people need to do. Um, some of the other lessons we learned from those we haven't been great at applying. Um, so for example, re having really good, accurate information um, helps people feel less anxious. And unfortunately mm. in the US, we've had 
such mixed information, um, complicated information, that that has only increased people's anxiety. Um, and so I think that um, those are some of the lessons we learned. The other lessons we learned from previous, from I know from Ebola and I think SARS is that um, people who've experienced these conditions, and we are seeing this with COVID, have some increased mental health problems themselves. And that needs to be understood, but also that some of the mental health consequences can linger for a while. There were people who went back to communities that were affected by Ebola and found elevations in depression, anxiety, PTSD, even a year later, um, which just tells us that it, it is, once the pandemic's over, we, we will still likely have to address some of the mental health impacts. They don't just, they won't magically resolve when the pandemic's over. Yeah, uh, researchers, uh, there was a Lancet psychiatry uh, study that found that something like one in five COVID-19 survivors were diagnosed with a mental health condition, mm -hmm. like right. anxiety, depression. And so from that, what do you think can be done to better support patients during their illness and recovery? And then I guess, yeah, I always have more questions, but add yes. on for, for health workers too. Yeah, that's a great, um, those are great questions. So I think, I think in, in, um, one, so, so number one is just, and we are in a better place with this, providing better information about how the virus is spread and how you can affect, uh, protect yourself. We actually didn't know that in March and April, and we actually know that now. I mean, hospital, I know hospitals in Boston, the ones I'm aware of have had zero community transmission. So, meaning transmission in the hospital, and that wasn't true in the spring. So, making sure that people have good information and have all the equipment. So, providing things like, you know, making sure places have adequate PPE and adequate staffing and then that the patients are given good information and that and their family members are given good information and then something that was really important for my own family when we had um, uh, relatives who died of COVID in March and again different situation then was that um, in that case they uh, we were able to fit FaceTime my brother-in-law's parents. We were, he was able to FaceTime with them and the nurses were actually really amazing in letting them communicate uh, with the family, even though they were isolated and obviously no one could visit. Um, and so I think paying attention to those things is really important. But one of the ways we can best serve our patients is to protect our healthcare workers and just to make sure that they have what they need and to listen to their needs. Do you have any advice about healthcare provider burnout or any advice about that? Yeah, it's really challenging. I guess the two things I would say about that is one, um, that it really needs to be addressed by the institutions. And I think institutions have stepped up more um, and that once um, for, for healthcare workers themselves, um, you know, once they, uh, we get through this next surge, I mean, they may not have much choice in terms of having to work a lot. Um, once we get through this next surge, that the that institutions provide ability to take time off or resources to you know if they need treatment, whether it's employee assistance program or other kinds of accommodations, parental leave, these kinds of things that those that those things be provided to them so that they can um, they can um, sort of recover from this. One thing that is being reported in some of the surveys we're doing is we're actually finding, we're just being, uh, what's been evidence is the resilience of healthcare workers. We expected to see um, much worse mental health outcomes. And this is not to say they're not stressed and burned out and suffering. Um, it's just that um, been amazed actually at how resilient the, the providers are. We just have a few minutes left, so yeah. <laughs> a few more questions. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have on cultural specific mental health tools, um, given the disproportionate impact, for example, of mental health on minority communities? Wow, that is, um, that, that is a really good question, um, which could probably be its own session. Um, and there, and also, yeah, and there have been some topics. So there's been some so, topics on that. Yeah. Um, so I would say that the, um, uh, one resource people can go to is the resources that are provided by the World Health, World Health Organization, their mental health resources. And the reason I'm pushing people there is because since people who are listening to this might be from all over the place, all over the world, is they have a number of resources and tools which are for specific communities in different languages, also globally. So I think that is really important. Um, and then the other, the other piece around that is to also um, 
um, you know, look at services at places like in Boston, I would say Boston Medical Center, places that are oriented towards treating diverse communities, because they're much more likely to have providers who provide culturally competent care. That's my sort of short answer, but it's a longer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to wrap up now, because we're about out of time, <laughs> okay. are there places around the globe you've seen that have been doing some things well in addressing this? Um, so, so the, that is, that's a good question. There's certainly places around the globe, for example, Kenya's one where um, there has been a attention at the, um, you know, national level to sort of national uh, mental health plans around COVID. So there are places that have done that. We'll we'll have to see over time how well that's implemented. I think that um, this might surprise people, but I really think that places, um, for example, countries in Europe that have provided um, a safety net for people in terms of their income, their job security, their healthcare and their housing have, um, I'm not sure this was the intention, but they have probably, that I would predict those things have mitigated worse mental health outcomes or prevented worse mental health outcomes. Um, we'll see, so I'm sure someone will do that analysis, someone, one of my colleagues, but um, because if you can really buffer people from the economic consequences that will um, you know, buffer them from some of the negative mental health consequences. We know that, we know that for sure. So finally, you have offered some kind of glimmers of hope throughout this conversation, which has been difficult. And I wanted to kind of end on an uplifting note. And I'm wondering, as we move forward into difficult, stressful times, what sort of message of hope do you have? Um, Well, I I guess my main message of hope is that um, we have seen incredible progress from the scientific community on vaccines. And also um, I think we will see them soon in treatments from what I hear. And, um, and in addition to that, we actually know a lot more about this virus and a lot more about how to prevent it um, among you know, ourselves, but also in our hospitals. So as scary as now is, we are in a much better position in my view than we were in the spring. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. If you can, it, you know, we need, we're in for, you know, a tough couple of months. But I do think that we will, once, once the vaccine gets rolled out, um, we will start seeing, we will feel like this is, we're at the end of this rather than, you know, just in the middle of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alana. Take care. Yeah, so that concludes our Facebook discussion. Uh, with Kirsten. Um, And this Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. You can view this full discussion on our Facebook pages and send feedback at forum, HSPH, and at PRI the World. I want to also take a moment to mention that if you or a family member need assistance with a mental health or substance use problem, you can call SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-4357. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. And we are also posting additional resources, some of which Kirsten mentioned on Facebook at Forum HSPH. You can also learn more about an online forum that, about mental health uh, and COVID-19 that Kirsten and her colleagues host. That is at hsph.me dash or slash uh, COVID-19 dash mental health, mental dash health dash forum dash series that will be online. Um, and please join us, join the forum again this coming Friday, November 20th at noon for a discussion about the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. Thanks again. Thank you.